What's up, Cole? If you're new here, my name is Jack Neal, and welcome to my YouTube channel, where we cover all things horrifying, disturbing, and morbid. If you haven't already, make sure to sacrifice that like button to the YouTube algorithm gods, or else. Today, we have three stories talking about true crime cases that to this day are a mystery. Let's get right into the video. And don't forget, look behind you. December 6, 2014. At around 8 p.m., a local firefighter named Cole Haley rushes to the scene of a massive car fire on Heron Road in Mississippi. Suddenly, he sees a figure engulfed in flames. It's a girl, wearing no clothes, walking on the side of the road next to her car. It's like something out of a horror movie. The woman begs, help me, help me, and Cole picks her up and carries her out of the street. Her hair is left in patches on her scalp, her face is pitch black, and her skin is scarred by horrific burns. She says her name is Jessica and that she's 19 years old, and when Cole asks her who started the fire, she says, Eric. Because of the deep burns in her throat, Cole can't decipher whether she said Eric or Derek. Cole immediately calls for medical help, but it isn't enough, and Jessica dies on her hospital bed the very next day. Upon searching through the messages in her phone, police can't find a trace of anyone named Eric or Derek contacting her in the past 30 days. However, she did contact the suspect, Quentin Tellis, who she had met up with on that day. And it's also worth noting that at this time, Quentin is being charged with the first degree murder of another woman. He denies ever seeing Jessica on December 6th, but video surveillance footage along with tracking on his cell phone prove otherwise. The video footage shows the two entering and leaving a store together and also shows Quentin mysteriously changing his outfit three times in the same day. But the last time Jessica is seen alive is at a gas station in Batesville with Quentin at around 5.30 in the morning. Police recover messages from Jessica's phone showing that Quentin had begged her to have sex with him four separate times with her responding no each time. The texts also show that Quentin is one of the very last people that she contacted before her death. It's believed that Quentin forced Jessica to have sex with him in the back of her car before strangling her and pouring lighter fluid down her throat. Quentin claims that he was getting a debit card for his girlfriend at the time that Jessica was being burned alive. But prosecutors believe that he ran to the bank so that he could have an alibi. And what's even more suspicious is that Quentin deleted all of his text messages to Jessica less than an hour after she was burned. He also makes no effort to call or text her after the fire, which is extremely strange considering the close nature of their relationship. Several days after the incident, Jessica's car keys are discovered on the road next to the crash and are immediately DNA tested. The test results show that the DNA of the car keys matches that of none other than Quentin Tellis, meaning that he was the last person to touch them. But despite this critical piece of evidence, jurors were split six to six and did not convict Quentin Tellis of first degree murder in the burning of Jessica Chambers. And although Quentin is not yet found guilty for Jessica's death, he remains imprisoned, serving time for the other murders he had committed before the Jessica Chambers case. April 8th, 2008. 22-year-old Jamie Fraley wakes up in the middle of the night with a horrible pain in her stomach. It's the stomach flu. At around 1.30 a.m., she calls her friend and lets her know that she's getting a ride to the hospital for the third time this week with an unnamed man in his truck. But Jamie Fraley never makes it to the hospital. The next day, Jamie misses an extremely important appointment, which is very unlike her, so her family goes to her apartment to check on her, but... It's empty. They find her keys and her wallet, but her phone is missing and there are no signs of evidence to point to the reason behind her disappearance. Jamie appears to have left the apartment willingly to go see a doctor, and the last person to see her is the man who picked her up that day. The prime suspect is none other than Jamie's father-in-law, Ricky Simmons Sr., who was released early from his 20-year prison sentence for strangling his ex-girlfriend to death. Ricky Simmons Sr. lived in the same apartment building as Jamie and gave her rides to the hospital earlier that week. Jamie's family says that he was absolutely obsessed with her, despite Jamie being engaged to his own son, Ricky Simmons Jr. Jamie's fiance was sentenced 15 months in prison for petty theft and was serving at the time of her disappearance, completely ruling him out as a suspect. Ricky Simmons Sr. is then brought into questioning, however, he refuses to take a lie detector test. And before he can be brought into court, he's found dead in his ex-girlfriend's car. However, this wasn't a murder, it was suicide. 
He'd accidentally trapped himself in the trunk of her car while trying to stalk her and instead died of a heat stroke. Several days later, his ex-girlfriend smells something unusual while driving her car and opens the trunk to find Ricky's dead body inside. When his body's discovered, police find her stolen keys and purse in his hands, along with a knife that he was planning to use to attack her. Although all signs seem to point to Ricky Simmons Sr. as the culprit, prosecutors have no physical evidence to prove it. Unfortunately, Ricky's secrets are buried with him to the grave. The only thing that may prove that Ricky Simmons Sr. is not the murderer is that in Jamie's last phone call, she's with a man in a truck. And Ricky Simmons Sr. did not own a truck. In fact, he owned a white van that he drove everywhere. Two days after Jamie's disappearance, police find her cell phone in the middle of the road about a mile away from her house. It's scuffed up and appears to have been thrown out of a moving vehicle. Unfortunately, after searching through her phone, police find nothing connected to her disappearance other than the last phone call she made where she leaves to the hospital with a mysterious driver. The Fraley family is feeling lost and hopeless with no clue of their daughter's whereabouts until one day, seven years later, police get a call that could solve the case. In 2013, the Gazette newspaper receives a letter from a man named Jerry Case who's a notorious killer and kidnapper. In his letter to the Gazette, he claims to have murdered Fraley and another woman whose house had been set on fire. But Jerry had served 22 years in prison at the time Jamie had disappeared, making it impossible for him to have been the killer. 13 years later, with lack of evidence and no witnesses, the disappearance of Jamie Fraley remains a mystery to this day. March 24th, 1994, a group of 63 travelers board a plane from Moscow to Hong Kong. The plane starts off with a smooth departure and the flight is off to a good start. But one of the pilots, Yaroslav Kudrinsky, makes a grave mistake. He lets his kids sit in the pilot seat and turns on autopilot so they can steer the plane without actually moving it. His children, Yana and Elder, take turns pretend steering until Elder accidentally puts too much pressure on the wheel, turning off the autopilot. In that instant, the lives of 75 people on board are in Elder's hands and he doesn't even know it. Suddenly, a red flashing light flickers in the cabin indicating that the plane is no longer in autopilot. But Kudrinsky and the other pilots brush it off as a false alarm and don't think much of it. Elder keeps turning the wheel all while steering the plane further and further off course. Several minutes later, Elder realizes that something is wrong. He shouts for help because he sees the plane is going in the wrong direction and the pilots scramble to the controls and are shocked to see that the autopilot is off. The plane then takes such an extreme right turn that it shifts 180 degrees in the complete opposite direction of where it should be headed. The plane also points upward at an extremely steep angle, almost completely perpendicular to the ground. At this point, the plane is 42,000 feet in the air, the maximum altitude commercial flights should fly. Any higher and the air will become too thin, causing the engine to fail. The pilots try to turn the plane in the right direction, but this particular plane is not built to handle such sharp turns at these high altitudes, so it begins to dive backwards. The pilots struggle to gain control and then switch back to autopilot. But in doing so, the engine stalls, all the screens go black, and the autopilot disengages permanently. The plane then swings its nose to the sky, completely vertical, pointing at the sun, and with the engines out, it falls backwards into the earth. Passengers scream with terror as the plane spins downward into a rocky mountain range below, falling extremely fast at 14,000 feet per minute. The plane is thrust into the mountainside, killing all 75 passengers instantly. They land just 12 miles of Kemerovo a major city in Russia. Initially, the airline tries to cover up the crash and denies that any children were ever in the cockpit trying to keep the reputation clean. They claim the flight was simply a freak accident. And with no survivors, there was no proof to show that it was a teenager that had caused the crash. However, voice recordings and other records were found in the remains of the crash, helping piece together the mystery surrounding Aeroflot Flight 593. 